Do you know what, Tuca? I think it would be very funny, bear in mind that's a black door and says number 10 on it, that you go the other side and come through it. Really? Number 10? I think you'd make a good Prime Minister. One day when you grow older, when you grow up. <laughs> Dragon's Den, Britain's most intense elevator pitch, in which aspiring entrepreneurs go head to head with five deal hungry multimillionaires. Peter Jones. I love this job. Titan of tech and the den's longest serving dragon. You need to take a deep breath. I know, I'm literally shaking. Deborah Meaden, the sustainability champion <laughs> who puts her money where her mouth is. Sadly, that money is staying right where it is. Tuka Suleiman, a fashion industry maverick <laughs> who's never afraid to take a punt. I have to be passionate. That's fascinating. Sarah Davies. I want to eat your face. The queen of crafts. Look at this way, Stephen. Who tells it exactly as it is. I'm just trying to cut through the BS and get it straight. Thank you. And Stephen Bartlett. Here we go. Boom, boom, boom. Social media mogul. He's the baby of the bunch. And bringer of fresh fire. Have you got anything nice to say, Tuka? No. Tonight. Are you hunting for food? Right, but that's going to shut you up for a good while, isn't it? You hope so. When you told me your story, I just it just hit me right in my feels. I don't even own a dog. Going forward, how could you see it could make money? I don't know. I have no idea. Your pitch today was bloody awful. You're right. That's why we're here today, to seek your expertise. What, you want a magic wand to make you profitable? Welcome to Dragon's Den, where a sliding doors moment awaits some aspiring business owners. But beware, closing a deal with a dragon is never straightforward. First to face the dragons this evening, are a father and son combo, Peter... We've got to get this, we've got to get this. ..and Chris Maxted, together with their two- and four-legged assistants, Courtney and Hudson. Have a good one, Hudson. That's us. Good luck, guys. We are going to present the Dragons with a really, really unique product. Right, well, Gates... For Chris, walking into the den will be a surreal experience. I've been watching Dragon's Den ever since I was a little boy and never before did I think we would be standing here about to pitch to five of the most influential business people in the country. <laughs> but I'm ready for it and it's excited. Hello Dragons, my name is Peter. And my name is Chris. We are here today to seek a £50,000 investment for a 10% equity share in our business, Doggate. The Doggate company designs and sells unique concertina dog safety gates, designed to fit multiple configurations, ranging from the front door, but to stairways, hallways and more. Doggate can be used as a training aid to improve a dog's behaviour at the front door, eliminating any risk of a dog escape when the front door is opened. When the gate's not in use, its unique design allows it to be concertinaed flat to one side, and the gate's modular capability enables it to be extended to any width. This year, we entered into the world of TikTok, and three videos that we have posted gained 27.7 million views, which staggered me in particular. We would like to use your investment to reduce our manufacturing costs. We need to improve our margins, and we want to explore the opportunity of working with retailers and wholesalers. We're going to give you a brief demonstration on how dog gates work, so, I am just going to knock on number 10 and see if anybody's in. So, you can see that at that point, the gate concertinas forming the barrier to allow Courtney to say hello to me. Hello, Courtney. And Hudson cannot escape. If Courtney wants to come out and join us, we have a quick release mechanism there which will allow her to come out and say hello. And that is our lovely dog, Hudson. That's our demonstration, and we welcome any questions. Thank you. Here, with their solution to dogs that go AWOL when the front door is opened, are Peter Maxted and his son, Chris. Hudson could not be less interested in dragons. Are you hunting for food? They're asking for £50,000 in return for 10% of the business. Thanks, Thanks Courtney. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Courtney. Thank you. Despite being the only dragon not to own a four-legged friend, 
Sarah Davies takes the lead with the questions. So, tell me, where did the idea come from then? What, what sparked all okay. of this? Um, we have run a pet sitting business. And as part of that business, we had people's dogs come in to stay at our house. Mm -hmm. A dog escape is a terrifying thing. If it's my dog, it's bad. If it's your dog, it's beyond yeah, it bad. So I looked around and there wasn't anything that did what I wanted it to do. So I came up with this dog gate. And, and how much does it cost you to make one of these? Uh, the front door version is £28 landed. And then um, the stair gate version is £46. Mm. And what do you sell them to for? So the, the stair gate version is eighty nine ninety five, and then the front door version is fifty nine ninety five. So yeah, yeah, you see, you haven't got a great deal of margin. The margin is not not the best. So at the moment, where are you selling this? Through TikTok, through our website, and through Amazon as well. So your business is only direct to consumer. Yes. So that is at fifty nine, cost you twenty eight. Yes. And what does it cost you to acquire a customer? Uh, at the moment, it's about £11.90. So £12. Your £28 plus your £12 is 40 Knock off your 20% VAT on 59 which is around 11 So, for, so you make about £8 a unit. Absolutely, yeah. So at the moment, you could not sell this in retail because there's no margin. No, absolutely. You're right. That's why we're here today, to seek your expertise. What, you want to, to magic wand to make you profitable? No, no, <laughs> but... Um, we, we know that with investment, we can bring down the cost of this gate. You need to buy this product between 12 and £14 pounds mm, absolutely. to be profitable. Mm. Yeah. We believe that's achievable. We do believe that's achievable. Meagre margins make dragons nervous, but Peter and Chris think a cash injection could give them the manufacturing makeover they need. Stephen Bartlett now wants to find out if the dog gate could be a portal to prosperity. What are you forecast for the business? What are you forecasting this year? This year we're forecasting a uh, £200,000 turnover. Yep. With 20,000 net profit. And what are we thinking about next year? We're predicting 375 with a net of 40,000. And then what happens in year three? We're looking to double year on year. So we have 750,000 with an 80,000 net. Um, and then can you tell me what happened with TikTok? The first video that went up, and it was like a million views. And it's like, oh, OK. What was the video of? Um, the front door version. Talk me through this video. Just want to see it in my head. Uh, what it is is the Beagle. That's why I brought the Beagle with me. Um, the one that's been most popular is 14.3 million, and it's been a case of me peeling off the adhesive, sticking it to the door and frame, slotting the gate into its brackets, opening the door, and the gate concertine is open, eliminating any risk. And that is the most popular one. And the beagle pokes its head round and has, and a, little it has a little claw at the gate. And Isn't social media just so powerful? It's yes. crazy. How many followers have you got on TikTok? 44,000 now. The news that they're rocking on TikTok has grabbed the attention of Stephen Bartlett. But Peter Jones wants to know if a similar product could do just as good a job. What would be the reason why I would use this over the child safety products that are out there today in terms of the doors, particularly the stair gate? It was born out of the fact that a lot of people said, I'd like something across my stairs other than a baby gate. They have the trip bar that a lot of people don't like. They're usually pressure fed, which as you knock them and they all ping off. So there's a lot of why people don't like a baby gate. The only thing I've, I would find is start putting nails in, in my walls and my doors. Well, and I, can... I would find that quite yeah. sort of intrusive. Yeah. We, we have, a, for the front doors, lots of UK front doors are composite or UPVC. So we deliberately have gone for a 3M tape on the back of the mounting bracket, right. so there is no need for screws. Right, so they will stick. Cleaned UPVC, yeah. they stick really well. Yeah. I'm glad you said that, because when I put the adhesive on this yeah. box, I, I thought, it's a bit easy to take off, isn't it? Mm. You're sticking it to the wrong surface area. What if my doors would at home? We, we advise getting a screw fixing in. So on certain surfaces, you do need screws? Yeah. Yes. And that's clear on all the instructions that it's a UPVC surface. OK. When I look at the, the product, um, I don't know whether it's because my little Pablo is so well behaved, <laughs> but I, I wouldn't buy one. When I open my door, Pablo sits there. 
He's only like this big though, so he's not really gonna mm -hmm. do much damage. So the, my excitement levels aren't tremendous for this. And your margin's not great. So that's gonna make it incredibly difficult as well. So for me, this isn't an investment that I think I can make um, a significant return on. So I'm gonna say I'm out. Despite being taken with the entrepreneur's TikTok talents, Stephen Bartlett stops the clock on his involvement. And Peter Jones is also ready to state whether he rates their gate. Peter, Chris, um, I really like the product. And as a dog owner, I'd probably buy the product. However, as a business of the size that I want to be part of, I'm not... I'm not there with it. I just can't see me making a sizable enough return. So for that reason, I'm going to say that I'm out. But well done. Thank you. Look, I think the pair of you are great. However, in this case, you'll face the hurdle of your margin. Yep. And you're probably going to need more money. Potentially. I don't think 50 grand is enough. No, for potentially. This you know? So, fortunately, I'm not going to invest in this. Okay. Uh, I'll leave that to my fellow dragons and I'm out. Tuka Suleiman decides to keep hold of his cash, and five dragons are now two. Is Sarah Davies sold on the canine confining concept? I've been sat there thinking, I don't even own a dog. It's probably not for me, this. But then the more you talk, the more I think, you're really solving a problem, you've got a unique product, and you know where I'm going to say this would be brilliant to sell, don't you? I think it's a highly demonstrable product, and if you're doing that well with it on TikTok, on TV shopping, I just think it's a fantastic product. So I will offer you all of the money, 50,000, for 25% of the business, but I would reduce my stake to 20% if I got my money back in 24 months. Thank you. Wow. The demonstrable dog gate has caught the imagination of TV shopping queen Sarah Davies, and she makes a move. Will Deborah Meaden take on the investor to her right or close the door on a deal? Guys, I, I, I love it. I think it's brilliant. Thank you. And I really like you as well. You know, so it's, sometimes I sit here and think, can't find a reason not to make an offer, <laughs> which is a good thing. Um, so I'm going to make you an offer. And I, I'm going to offer you all of the money, and I want 20... 20% 20 of the business. Thank, Thank you, you very much. It's a good offer. It is a good it's offer. It's a lovely offer. Mm. Think you need a moment with the wall. Two dragons are now duelling for the dog barrier business. I can't get the pair of them. Sarah Davies has dangled the prospect of TV shopping exposure, but asked for 25% of the equity, reducing to 20 if her money's repaid. Whilst Deborah Meaden wants a straight 20% cut. Would Sarah be interested? Much in Deborah's offer. But there's only 10% on the table. And Peter and Chris aren't done. Full disclosure, we would love to work with the pair of you. Would you consider 25,000 each for 12.5% each? I'd love to work with Sarah, but I, I'm looking for, OK, what, what, what haven't I got mm -hmm. that you want? We know that you are better, you know, you are very well placed within the pet sector. That's one big difference between I don't think that really answers it. Sorry. It's like kind of what do what do what do each of us bring? And it's, I'll, it's... I'll be really honest, guys. Sometimes having two of us does overcomplicate it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. And, okay. And, that's and fine. from well, then from we my... have to ask. Yeah. But for... if the offers still stand, then we would love to accept yours, Deborah. Oh. Because <laughs> you were looking at Sarah, I was expecting you to say if the offer still stands, Sarah, I'd like to accept yours. I am delighted. <laughs> we are. Well, well, well done, guys. So, thank you so much well for done. your so appreciate it. Keep your eye on the future. Peter and Chris make a beeline for Deborah Meaden and tie up a deal. They depart with the fifty thousand pounds they were seeking 
and with a super happy, if slightly surprised, dragon on board. Well, as a great reader of broad body language, I got that completely it's wrong. wrong you, they were looking you, at you and me both <laughs> got that completely wrong. <laughs> That'll no. teach me to be greedy and not be prepared to share. Lesson learned. <laughs> I was concerned that it was, was going to go yeah. wrong when, was when they sort of indicated that they weren't willing to sort of work together. I did nail it quite quickly. Yeah, you did, yeah. <laughs> I'm Good thankful that you did. Next into the den is Lucy Norris, who's returned to the UK after spending 15 years in New York, where she worked as a TV fashion reporter. Even though I've spent time in front of the camera as a presenter, walking in front of these dragons into a den is worse than live TV. Honestly, I cannot tell you how petrified I am. Lucy has come up with a clothing concept that she's hoping will be a hit on the high street. What we have for the dragons today is a way of changing the mindset behind consumers and the way that they decide to shop, style and source. I love that pink dress. Isn't that gorgeous? There's one dragon in particular that Lucy thinks could be the perfect fit for her fashion business. My favourite dragon is Sarah. I'm very drawn to the way that she speaks to people and what she offers businesses. But don't tell the other dragons I said that. <laughs> Hi, dragons. I'm Lucy. I'm the co-founder of Secondhand Styling UK, a subscription-based retail model that celebrates clothes that already exist encouraging our members to swap those clothes with other like-minded individuals. I spent 15 years in America as a TV presenter and fashion correspondent, and as I interviewed the celebrities, I was keeping a little secret. I was always wearing secondhand, but I knew how to make pre-loved look premium. Now, two years ago, I moved back to the UK and I realised my ability to be able to source and style secondhand was something that I wanted to share with others. So I built a series of pop-ups, and now I want to create our first concept swap shop. So for £25 a month, our members will be able to swap five items from their own closet for five items in the concept store. So our model helps to curb the worst consequences of fast fashion and also create a positive and guilt-free shopping experience without new clothes having to be produced. I'm asking for a £70,000 investment for 12% equity of the company. Now, I invite you to have a look at the concept swap shop to see what we have to offer and also any questions that you may have. A subscription-based business allowing people to swap unloved items from their wardrobe is the brainchild of Lucy Norris. It's like a jumble sale, isn't it? <laughs> a premium style of jumble sale, now in a boutique. She's asking for £70,000. That does look lovely. In return for 12% of her company. A never not dapper Peter Jones is first to find out more. So I'm intrigued. So. The business so far, is this a business, have you been trading long? No, so I started the business four months ago with some pop-up shops and that was when I realised to have a permanent space would be the best way forward. Okay, but your idea that you've pitched yeah. is an online concept, is it? No, it's a physical store. And where's the physical store? So we have a space that I would like for it to be. So you haven't got it yet? No. And the £25 a month that you're asking people to subscribe, yeah. how many of those have you onboarded? So we have 120 subscribers to our actual platform. But are they paying you £25 a month yet? No. So it's purely a concept at the moment? It is, yes. But it's not a new concept, is it? Deborah, for example, she, I don't think she'll mind me saying, but she's wearing clothes that are not brand new. Is that right, Deborah? Actually, no, Sarah. This is a rental dress which has had five previous owners Thanks. before I'm wearing it sitting here in the den. 
That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And it looks brand new. It's a £200 high street dress that's £25 a go to rent. It was a really easy service for me to use. If I look five years ago and I was buying second-hand clothes, I was having to buy them on eBay mm -hmm. or in a charity shop. There was nowhere else to buy them. Now, the last 12 months, I have been buying from so many different companies. So I think you are bang on the money with what you are trying to solve. And I think you're at exactly the right time. Thank you. Lucy gets a big thumbs up from her dream dragon. But has fashion retailer Tuka Suleiman spotted a potential problem with the sustainable swap shop idea? So, assuming that I'm going to come in and swap, so I will pick my worst 10 products and I'll come in and take your nice products. Yeah. And then my worst products that look terrible will now go on your rails. And by the time you've had 40 customers, mm -hmm. your rails will be full of awful products. How do you get around that? So we have a, a tier programme. Right. So basically, it will start off, a basic swap is your high street fashion. Then we would go into a good swap, which is your high end fashion. And then later on, we can build out that into a tier system. Can I tell you something, Lucy? You will end up, after a couple of weeks or so, your shop looking like a real jumble sale. And, and I, I think you'll find that uh, people will bring in damaged goods, floors, you know, and, and you won't be able to control it. Lucy, can yeah. I just pick up on that? How do you intend to clean and repair? So we will make sure that everything is steam cleaned before it goes back out. And I would like to partner with someone to make sure that we are mending. So you've got £5 per piece yes. per month to take in, handle, steam clean, repair. Have you honestly factored in all of the time that that's going to take for you to do that? Yes, and that is where the quality control, it really is important, so we will have to turn away certain items. But turning away costs time. No, I agree with you. You've got yeah. to stand there and look at something and say, yes, that's fine, that can go on the rail and that can't. On top of that, you've got to pay your, your heating, your rent, any staff. I just don't see how you can handle each one of those pieces for five pounds and make any money out of it. Deborah Meaden doubts Lucy's business model will produce any profit. Peter Jones now wants to shine a light on a subject that never goes out of style, the price tag that's been placed on the company. Lucy, your sort of idea you're valuing at about £600,000. Yeah. This is quite brave to come in to the den without a business being established and sell a concept yeah. at a quite a big premium for an idea. What is your skill in making that business happen that can give credibility to why we should invest? First of all, my ability to be able to source and make something look premium. So I can curate it, I can help style people. My experience in the fashion industry and actually being backstage at fashion shows, speaking to designers, and yes, I do agree with you, Peter. I am very brave coming in here <laughs> with a concept. However, I believe in it. And can I just say on that moment, just on the, the amount that I'm asking for, I don't want to come in and looking like I'm uh, aiming sky high, which is obviously what has happened, but I've tried to bring those numbers down. Lucy, the only thing I will say about <laughs> that, it's actually not even just the amount, it's the valuation. Okay. And actually, you've got off quite lightly because something has to underpin a valuation. Mm -hmm. And if I'm going to go out and raise money and I'm going to convince an investor on something that is untried, untested, mm -hmm. you needed to come in here and say, this is why mm -hmm. this is going to work. And you haven't sorted it out yet. Now, you're doing something that I would absolutely have loved. If this was the solution, there's my money. <laughs> Sadly, that money is staying right where it is. I'm really sorry, I won't be investing. I'm out. An ambitious valuation and £70,000 request 
has cost Lucy her first dragon. What does Stephen Bartlett make of the second-hand swap scheme? There's quite a few high street, like, pop-up fashion concepts. You know, the one where you bring in a bag and you can fill it up and it, you pay five pounds for the full bag mm -hmm. and stuff like that. There's also swap concepts, right, yeah. that are on the high street as well. My, my point there is concepts get copied quick. Mm -hmm. And this concept, if it is viable, well, well everyone will do it everywhere. I, I, I can start a swap shop in Birmingham or I can start a swap shop in Manchester. So that feels like a big risk for your company that anybody could do this. So. On that basis, I'm, I feel like I'm unable to invest. So I'm out. I'm obviously sitting here, which probably isn't my job, really, to sit here to think, how could you turn something that you've pitched in and make it a business? And the reason why I say it's not my job, that's your job. And I think that's what probably you need to do, is go back and really think hard about how can you create a business and a concept, then trial it, and then go and try and raise money for it. Um, because you've got a passion for it. But it's very difficult to part with £70,000 on a concept. So for that reason, I'm out. Can I tell you something, Lucy? With all due respect to you, you're asking for £600,000 valuation. You're a one-man band. This is not scalable. And for that reason, this is not investable, and I'm out. Tuka Suleiman pulls down the shutters on a deal. But earlier, Lucy found a kindred spirit in pre-loved fan Sarah Davies. Will her favourite dragon make this a vintage moment by making an offer? Lucy. I was really excited when you came in with all of the credentials you have to be able to do the styling, because that's the bit I struggle with. Mm -hmm. I need someone to help me say, that jacket will really go well with that dress. And that is what you can do. The problem is, essentially, you're asking us to put blind faith in your commercial model and bankroll it for a tiny proportion of the company. And I don't believe that the model is right. So I'm actually going to tell you Please go away and don't do this business. Don't launch this business. Go and try and find another way to achieve the same goal because this is not the solution the commercials won't stack up. And when you do find the solution, you come and hunt me down because I would love to invest in it. I'm desperate too, but this isn't the one today. Okay. I'm really sorry. So I can't invest and I'm out, but all the best to find that solution. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, Lucy. Thank, Thank you. you. Good, luck. Good luck with this. Sarah Davies isn't sold on the pre-loved swap shop and Lucy's clobber concept crashes and burns. Obviously disappointed, but I knew it was going to be a hard sell. I didn't get the outcome that I would have hoped for, but it's not going to stop me from trying to find a solution for a big problem that someone needs to fix. Next up tonight are Matthew Walker and Christian Brownlee. Christian, yeah, break a leg. <laughs> They're already broken. <laughs> Who have plenty of confidence in the product they're about to show the dragons. What we're bringing in is going to change what everyone ever knew about disability and mobility. When I'm on the machine, it just enables me to do everything. There's, there's, there's no limitations. Those are some hefty wheels. Mm, Off-road. That's super cool. I think this is really innovative. And it's going to be changing lives. Hello, dragons. My name is Matt. And my name is Christian. We are the founders of Adaptability, and we're here today to ask for £40,000 in return for 5% equity. There is a real need amongst the disabled community for a better mobility solution. Both Christian and I have sustained spinal cord injuries and are permanently paralysed, myself from the waist down and Christian from the chest down. The equipment currently available to wheelchair users is outdated and it doesn't offer true independence. 
These sorts of chairs can develop terrible posture, long-term shoulder and wrist injuries, and take it from me, using them is not an enjoyable experience. Our first solution is the Omeo, the world's only hands-free mobility device. It allows the operator to instinctively move simply by shifting their body weight in the desired direction that they want to choose, very similar to walking. The Omeo can access nearly all terrain, whether it's muddy pathways, gravel, sandy beaches, it will do it with ease. We assemble the Omeos here in the UK. We have the exclusive distribution rights within the UK and Ireland, and Europe is also on the table for us. I'd like to introduce Tina, our engineer, and she'll be here to assist you if you'd like to have a try. I'd like to. I'll have a go. A state-of-the-art, self-balancing mobility device is the offering from Matthew Walker and Christian Brownlee. You feeling safe? Not really. And how are you? How do I go faster? You can oh. lean forward faster. I will be here just to hold you back a little bit. Very <laughs> cool. <laughs> Whee! The entrepreneurs are asking for £40,000. Go on then, your turn. Oh, wow. wow. In return for 5% of their company. Yeah, it's really clever. Sarah Davies is first to road test the business, and it looks like she's impressed with what she's seen so far. Matt, Hello. Christian. Wow, that was some pitch. Yeah. Thank I you. was totally blown away. I've never seen anything like this. It's incredible. OK, so how long have you been going? Well, I founded uh, Adaptability in uh, 2020. Um, I was the uh, first person in the country to um, bring one of these over into the UK. Uh, it's a New Zealand uh, technology. Oh. I saw it and I thought, well, I mean, my life wasn't very independent. Um, I was staying at home all the time uh, since I was a wheelchair user, so about 10 years ago. And yeah, it was a pretty, pretty miserable uh, existence, but um, I, I saw this online and I just thought this might just turn things around. So I, I got it, they, they shipped it over and uh, I got on it. And I, the first thing I did was I just went into the forest and it was just, it, it was an incredible experience for me. I, it was, I, I don't know how I can explain how you just, how you live such a dependent life and then, you know, all of a sudden you, you're by yourself and you're living it, you know, so, um, I decided, let's, let's make a business out of this. So, go on then, the million dollar question. What does something like that set a user back? Brand new, £17,230. What do you pay for that one then? Uh, about £12,000 to £12,500. So, how long have you been selling them for now? We have been selling for about nine to ten months. So, in nine to ten months, what has your turnover been? £250. Four. Uh, 4,000. And so you are, are you, do you have a showroom here? Are you bringing the parts in and then building them to specification or...? We get the seat steering technology from um, the inventor, Omeo Technology, and we also get the self-balancing technology from China. So you're not just selling the product as it comes from the New Zealand no. company? No, we build no. them. You no. assemble right. them. And you're using some of their technology and someone yeah. else's technology? So these are, these are unique to you yeah. then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a confident start for the entrepreneurs, who reveal they put their own UK stamp on a potentially game-changing product. However, Peter Jones has some concerns about the price point of the mobility machine. At 17,200, it is the price of a car. Of, of a oh. car. Yep. Um, so what is it that's making that cost so high? Is there an element of this for the inventor that he's taking a large slug of the cake? I'm not privy to the exact uh, financials of the business, but I know that their cut isn't huge. Um, so the seat steering technology is around £7,000, oh. and the self-balancing technology is around £5,000. So the seat technology is £7,000 in itself? Yes. What is in that seat that is making that so expensive? I'm not sure. Um, Component-wise, I don't know what each individual uh, cost is to build. Um, we don't do any manufacturing. No, but I'm trying to think, how do you scale this into a big business? So how do we bring that cost down? I think we need to be talking about bulk orders, but we would need a lot of storage space for that. Um, well, that's easy. Bulk, that can go into any warehouse, anywhere. 
Yeah, they're so expensive warehouses. Well, it depends where you've what, what Like you've right got. now, what we have is a, a small outbuilding on part of my property, which is our uh, workshop, basically. Yeah, but that's not them. where we go with this. Where we go with this, we make it big. It goes into distribution, goes into a supply chain network. So that wouldn't be difficult. Yeah. Peter Jones is thinking big, a sure sign he believes the proposition has potential. Tuka Suleiman now wants to drill down into the details of the deal with the overseas suppliers of their device. So your distribution agreement, yeah. how long is it for? OK, so we have two separate agreements. We have a uh, original equipment manufacturer's agreement with Omeo Technology. Uh, that allows us to, to well, build and uh, sell, which means that we, uh, we just have a lot more control over yeah. what we do with the product. We also have a distributor agreement with a company who supplies us with the self-balancing technology. Our agreement, off the top of my head, I think it's just reviewed annually. So, yeah. But you have to reach any targets. Is it the worst thing is you build a business, yeah. Yeah. at the end of the year they say, oh, that's a, that's a good business that, that, that these guys have created for us. We'll do it ourselves. Yeah. Sure. Uh, 60 units, 60 units. a year, which is equivalent to about five a month. Yeah, and, and do you think that that's easily achievable? I think if we get the word out, I think yeah. it will be very easily achievable. Yeah. Like, right now, we sell on average about two a month, <laughs> right. and that's just solely word of mouth. We don't do any marketing yet. The entrepreneurs insist they're able to scale, although they aren't quite hitting those targets yet. And Peter Jones has spotted a discrepancy in their terminology that he wants to pick up on. You said that you're, you're an OEM, an original equipment manufacturer. So just to clarify this, I don't think you are an OEM because you are just putting things together. And over 20 or 30 years, I've been involved with some of the world's biggest brands and to, taking their products to market. Technology-based brands like Samsung, they're obviously the OEM. They are mm -hmm. the original equipment manufacturer. And when you work with them as a distributor, the reason why that business model really works is because the OEM is ultimately funding and driving its brand across the marketplaces of which mm -hmm. it wants to draw awareness. Right. I think this is where there is a, a loose cog in your wheel in terms of your current model, is that the inventor or brand owner the fact that they've given the distribution away, they're not going to invest in the brand to help you in territories of which you are the sole distributor of. So you're spending money on brand awareness, the thing actually that the OEM should be doing. Mm. You're then investing in everything, something the OEM should be doing. And there's, there's where the disconnect is. And I think that that needs to be resolved. I think you have got a super product but without the inventor here I find it very difficult to get across the line and invest so for that reason I'm out but good luck an unnecessary financial burden within the structure of the business compels Peter Jones to decline the deal and Deborah Meaden is ready to give her verdict on the groundbreaking mobility device I'm gonna tell you where I am um, my problem is that you don't own the you IP. don't own the IP, you don't really own the manufacturing. Yep. And that is a bit of a worry for me. So I absolutely applaud you on spotting you. it and bringing it over here, but I'm finding it hard to see how I would turn that into a decent sized business. For me, no problem. great for you, but Thank not you. for me. But so I won't be investing. I'm out. It's it's not a straightforward business to take to market. And I don't have a huge experience in marketing this kind of product so maybe you're a little bit too early now for an investment from me um, but maybe you're not Do you know what when you told me your story I just it just hit me right in my feels I can't imagine what it, what it must be like to lose your mobility at any stage in your life. And I just, I, I've got so much respect for you for being in that situation and turning it into something like this, turning it into a business. And 
I'm, I'm pretty overcome with inspiration, so I am going to make you an offer, it turns out. Um, I'm going to offer you all of the money, and um, I want 15% of the business. Wow. Ah, oh, can't breathe. <laughs> it looked like he was about to go out, but Stephen Bartlett is very much in as he makes a play for the proposition. Is Sarah Davies about to follow his lead? Uh, guys, I'll cut straight to the chase. I really love your business. I would very much like to work with you, and I would love to make you an offer. <sighs> I would like to offer you all of the money for 15% of the business. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love what you do. And my background, as you know, is manufacturing, importing, marketing, opening doors, knowing retailers. That's me. So I, too, am going to make you an offer. I'm going to offer you all of the money for 15% too. So you've got some thinking to do. Yes. Do we need to go to the wall? <laughs> Over there. Well, they also have lights, by the way, which are really... <laughs> oh, oh, you should have said that earlier. You might have got five dragons going for it. There are now three identical offers for Matthew and Christian to consider. Can I just take a breath? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> Stephen Bartlett, Sarah Davies and Tuka Suleiman all want 15% of the company in return for the £40,000 the duo are asking for. I want to go with the most passionate to make it happen. But there's only 5% on the table and the pressure is mounting. I don't know. I have no idea. OK. Um, okay, so honestly, I don't know what to uh, do. So um, I, I wanted to first ask, would the three of you be interested at all in uh, splitting that to together? I don't know what I'm saying I, anymore. I can answer for myself that I certainly, in this case, would be willing to share with the, my fellow dragons if they would be open to that. From my point of view, I would be more than happy to share it. And how can I refuse that? So I'll confirm. We will give you the 40,000 between the three of us in return for 5% each of the business. So in total, you will give away 15% I of the business. I can't do the maths in my, my head no. right now for no, that. No, um, no. But, yep. like... We all good? Right. Yes. We got yes. a deal? Yes. Do we? We got a deal. Yeah. Wow. Well done. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Get out that lift and go and celebrate. Yes. Wow. OK. Thank you so much. Matthew and Christian have done it. They depart with the £40,000 they came for, along with three new shareholders in their burgeoning business. Oh. Wow, like, amazing. <laughs> three. Well done. Yeah, yep. that's great. That's £13,333 well spent. Time to roll the socks up now, isn't it? Bring on the challenge. Yeah. It's going to be great. Last into the den, a fervent foodie with a fresh take on takeaway. I'm bringing to the dragons access to the most exciting food movement since organic. And some representatives of that movement are already in the den, prepping some savoury samples. So what's going on then? Are you cooking? We're cooking you some tacos. Hey, tremendous. Fantastic. Food journalist Richard Johnson is gaga about grub, but the only thing in his stomach right now are butterflies. I'm terrified to go into the den. I practised this till I was running out of oxygen in front of the kids, but going into the den is a whole different level. I mean, I've thought so many times about the idea of getting an investment. It would, like that, change my life. Hello there, dragons. My name's Richard Johnson. I'm here to ask for £60,000 for 9% of my business, Street Food Ventures. I'm an award-winning food journalist. 
one time restaurant critic at the independent uh, but the best food i've ever eaten wasn't always michelin starred um, i remember a falafel shack a little hole in the wall in jerusalem i remember a burger joint searing hot griddle caramelizing the outside of the meat to retain the juices and closhing the melted cheese the carpet land car park in peckham street food we don't want starter main course dessert anymore we want flirty low commitment dining and that's what i'm all about i'm obsessed with street food i literally wrote the book on it you'll see in your in your box later in 2010 i uh, set up the british street food awards the oscars of the street food world in 2017 we set up the european street food awards and this year we will be in 17 different european countries and at the end of the year we launch in america so what i'm presenting to you as an opportunity is is sponsorship global franchising opportunities and a first look deal on amazing exciting independent businesses that the high street of tomorrow so uh, are you hungry absolutely Always. So we've got two award winners, um, Ginger's Comfort Emporium and Polithco, both who've come through the award system. On the menu tonight, a street food awards company served up by food writer Richard Johnson. What we've got for you is Italian sesame glazed cauliflower. It comes with a cauliflower miso puree, a Valentina hot sauce, star anise pickled carrots, uh, spring onion, and it's served on a corn tortilla. And this is street food. That's extraordinary. Richard's asking for £60,000 in return for 9% of his business. Right, but that's going to shut you up for a good while, isn't it? You hope so. Amazing. Richard's flavoursome pitch has left Peter Jones hungry for more. That was a, a nice start. So I just want to be clear. Are we investing in basically an events business, the awards business that you've got? Is that the idea? Uh, yes. OK, how much money has that awards business generated? So give me just the last two years. OK, 2020, uh, turnover was 367,000. Gross profit on that? Uh, uh, 200. 200 gross profit? Yeah. And net profit? Uh, 367. Uh, sorry, 210 net profit. Net? So how did you get to... No, no, I, got the, I got the gross figure wrong. I, d I only learnt net, so my brain doesn't work very well. What, with numbers, or...? No, no, it works very well with numbers, but not in a particular order, so I'm just trying to... OK. I have it... So revenue, right. 367. Yeah. Let's go to the net profit, then. What was the net profit? 210. Then Covid hit, and it went from 367 down to 200 and... Uh, 210, and then down to 85. Well, so it's really, it's, yeah. it's on a slippery slope. Yeah. Why is that? To try and run live events in a time of virus was just, I mean, it would have been simpler if we just closed, but we chose to keep the awards going. And basically people didn't want to be around other people. They didn't want to be eating. No, 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 I to totally be... get what so... the pandemic did. It's, it was, I mean, it was unbelievable. But I'm trying to get a handle of what you've got now. So you want to really ultimately bring back to life your business because your business ultimately has had a heart attack. Yeah. So, what are you planning to do? Give me the forecast then for this year. Have you got a plan for this year? Uh, so, we've already started uh, this year's awards. So, we've just had the Welsh Street Food Awards and we were absolutely rammed. What did that generate, the Welsh Awards? Well, th this, is, this is more of a sponsorship play. The, the events themselves, um, I mean, the, the, I'm only just beginning to... I, I work with event partners. What I'm trying to get to, Richard, is how... I'm trying to work out if you've got a business. I'm trying to work out what is the business. The business is, is the beginnings of a sponsorship and uh, a franchising business. So it's a concept, basically, that you go out to other people to sell the awards. People will sponsor it and you'll come out with, hopefully, a business at the end of it. Yes. Yeah, well, I do have a business at the end of it. Richard is insistent that his street food idea won't prove to be just a flash in the pan. But it seems Stephen Bartlett finds the proposition less problematical. I get the business, I actually really understand the concept. You're throwing in an event and sponsors are your main revenue stream. 
And so the bigger this event becomes, the more sponsors you're willing to attract, the more you can charge them. I get it. I've ran events before. We've owned events in my previous company. So what are your like, blind spots as an entrepreneur? Sponsorship and franchising. My experience with sponsorship people hasn't been great. You know, I, I want to understand how, how to do it properly. Um, and I feel like there is a bit of a dark art. And as much as I read about it, I, I'm still getting it wrong. Richard, in answer to Stephen's question of what are your blind spots, you alarmingly have just named the two revenue drivers. You said I'm blind about sponsorship and I'm blind about franchising. So who in your organisation actually drives the revenue? Uh, at the moment, it's me. It, it's me pulling the strings, talking to people. But the large sponsors have always contacted me, you know? And I just think if I had a Rolodex or the digital equivalent, then um, I would know who to pick up the phone to. Richard, you're a journalist. Don't tell me you were shy about picking the phone up. No, 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 I'm not. I'm not. You're also a journalist who I am quite sure could find out the right people to pick the phone up to. So that isn't sitting well with me. But if you want sponsors, I don't think you cold call. I don't think people respond well to that. I will do sponsorship to the best of my ability. What I'm saying is uh, my ability is not good enough. I am missing opportunities. OK. So franchising, which is your other revenue stream. How, do, how does that work? As a franchisee, what do I pay you? Um, I've been loath to charge anything. At the moment, all the countries are competing in Europe for, for free. And how do you make money out of that? I don't. I don't. At the moment, because uh, I thought that the best way to build this business is to build it first and then think about how I'm going to make money from it later. That is probably a very flawed way of doing it. So... Going forward, how could you see it could make money? OK, I, I don't yes. think he knows. Uh, and I, yeah. I don't think you know, Richard. That's the honest no, I, answer. I don't know, Peter, is the, is, is the honest truth. What's the plan the next 12 months? What are you going to do? Uh, well, I at the end of the year, we launch in America. So try But and, launch um, what? Launch the American Street Food Awards. And how do you monetize that? Uh, well, we're speaking to a, a sponsorship person at the moment in the States who seems very confident about the, about the kinds of money that he can, he can attract. But what are you are asking bringing them for? over to America with names Richard, this that... is painful. Uh, what, what are you asking them for? What's your pitch to them? Maybe I can get there with that. Well, if you don't get that street food is exciting... No, no, no. If you don't no, get that these are new food brands... No, what I don't get is your business. I totally get street food. I love street food. But I don't get your business. Peter Jones tries, yet fails, to nail how Richard plans to make money. However, Sarah Davies thinks she's had a light bulb moment whilst polishing off her sweet treat. I wrote down here as I was in the middle of my very nice ice cream, he's looking at us for sponsorship. No, no, no. What? what you looking, personally? No, well, you're looking... Oh, we can talk. You're looking for someone <laughs> with a little black book or the Rolodex, as you described it, for us to open our Rolodex for you to pitch all of our contacts for sponsorship. Am I accurate in what I'm finding you're looking for well, here? I, I would be stupid to say that's not true. What I just don't understand is how the business becomes a money-making proposition. And I think you obviously don't know that. And the philosophy of, well, I'll just build the business and then hopefully monetize it, that is not how you can incentivize an investor to come on board. You've painted the lovely picture of the street food, just not of the business opportunity, I don't see how I can invest, um, so I'm out. Sarah Davies departs and Richard is a dragon down. But Deborah Meaden has just clicked that she's seen Richard somewhere before. Could his TV reporting stint on a groundbreaking cookery show signal a change in his fortune? Richard, you did... Kill it, cook it, eat it. I did, yeah. I, I, I was looking at you thinking... I, so that started my journey towards plant-based. Really? Yeah, you did it with Julia Bradbury, wasn't it? Yeah, she did Series 2. She did Series 2, that's right. Yeah, kill it, cook it, eat it. My goodness, that was quite something. Anyway, at the moment, there isn't enough solidity to this business. So what I look for in a business is sort of this core that you can understand why that business is going to work. 
but you at the moment are still doing this. That's all right, businesses do that. What they can't do is do that in front of an investor, which means I'm afraid I can't invest, so I'm out. What you need in your business is, I think, clearly an account manager slash salesperson who can run the commercial side of the business. And if you manage to get an ops person, they could potentially tell you exactly how it should run. I don't think you need to expand to the United States. You need to get your business to a, to a point where it can run without you before you go to the United States. Additionally, franchising should be off the table because when you franchise a business, you're handing over a blueprint. You haven't figured out the blueprint yet. For me, this isn't the right time for you to raise investment. So I'm going to say that I'm out. I'll tell you what I think, Richard. This is not an investable business for me where I think I can make a return on my investment. So for that reason, Richard, I'm out. Thank you, Tupa. Three more dragons head for the exit, and only Peter Jones remains. He's already had two attempts at working out the business, and it seems he has zero appetite for thirds. I think that this is awful. I'm not going to sort of pussyfoot around because I think that you are somebody that can take constructive feedback and go do something about it. You're clearly an acclaimed writer. And I've looked at your book, by the way, which I think is superb. But from a business perspective, you have not got a clue. You're unable to explain what the business does. You're unable to explain how you're going to get income. You have to start up with the basics of a business idea and see it through to the end, if I have any chance. And your pitch today was bloody awful. So I'm going to wish you well on your way and say that I'm out. But good luck. Thanks very much, Dragons. Thank you. It's the end of the road for Richard's street food awards business, which fails to tickle the Dragons' taste buds, unlike the food itself. I looked over at Tuca and he's First almost... First time ever. Licked the First yeah, time the ever plate. in the den. I've eaten everything. <laughs> First time. It's just a shame that wasn't what the investment was. I'm disappointed, but um, I've learned a lot. I mean, there are so many ideas. I need to write it all down before I forget it. See, I think he's got a business. He just doesn't know what it is. The dragons saw that I was passionate about what I do, so at least that came across. I, th I think they were wrong for not investing but um, I appreciate their advice. So the street food offering lacked that business umami necessary to bag a dragon. However, with investments in a hands-free self-balancing mobility device and an extendable dog gate this evening, just goes to show that anything and everything has the chance of being backed when it's brought into Dragon's Den. Next time. I'm sorry, you'll really have to fight to get our attention now. That was absolutely stunning. I was in here back in 2015. You offered me all the money. Oh, and you rejected him. Yeah, Dad, I'm sorry. Was that a counter or was that a joke? If you don't know the answer, you yeah. can say I don't know the answer. Yeah. It's a better place to be. I understand about as much about this as I do about how to wire a plug. I, I want to give you all of the money, but I want 30%. Dracula.